we've been we've been talking the last uh, couple weeks about the Apostle Paul telling us not to conform to the patterns of this world, but instead to be transformed, how? By the renewing of our minds. And we talked about the fact that every time we think a thought, that we are actually creating neural pathways in our minds, uh, or uh, these little pathways in our minds, which cause that thought to be easier to think again and again. And so the more often you think a thought, the easier it is to think that thought again. That's why if you dwell on the negative and find yourself thinking negative thoughts a lot, it's almost impossible to be happy because you will just continue to think those negative thoughts over and over. But the opposite is also true. If you find yourself able to dwell on the positive and to think on the positive, the more you think positive thoughts, the more positive you will think positive thoughts and the more positive your life will be. And we have said, this is not just the power of positive thinking. This is the power of God. He created us, he created our minds, and he has his Holy Spirit working in us. So through the power of God and the power of his creation in our minds, you don't have to be stuck and stay with a negative life or negative thoughts. So we talked about the fact that there's lies each of us tell ourselves, and when we believe that lie and we tell it over and over long enough, it's almost impossible to get away from that lie. Lies like, you're not good enough. Nobody likes you. God won't forgive you for your past mistakes. By the way, if I look at you and I say one of those, I'm not saying that's what you think. It's hard, right? I'm just trying to have eye contact with you. But these are all lies that we tell ourselves, and we, we talked about some of those. Now, last week we also talked about a different type of lie that we tell ourselves and believe. Although a lie seems a little strong, maybe like a, a just something that's not true, maybe an error in our thinking, and those come in the form of cognitive biases. Cognitive biases uh, or mental filters uh, through which we see situations and other people. So cognitive bias is a mistake in reasoning based on past personal experiences or our personal preferences. And depending on your circumstances, you have filters through which you might see situations inaccurately or incompletely. So some of the biases we talked about last week, uh, confirmation bias, which is where we unconsciously, we don't really know we're doing it, but we focus on things that align with what we already believe. And we're more likely to listen to those who validate our beliefs that we already hold. So another one, the anchoring bias, is it's our tendency that the very first piece of information we hear about something we tend to like then hold on to that as an anchor, and then as other information comes in from different sources, we weigh it against that, but because that was the first thing we heard, somehow we tend to think that is the truth, or that's the most accurate piece of information. This other one, I like the name of it, I said the truthiness bias, and this is a tendency for us to believe a statement, either one, if it's just easy to kind of understand, or two, when we hear that same piece of information three or four different times, then all of a sudden we're like, oh, that's the truth. Well, I heard this person say it, and I heard it over here, so this must be true, even though that may be inaccurate. So here's the problems with our cognitive bias and mental filters. They cause us to have an inability to listen to opposing views objectively. Instead of being able to sit down and say, okay, well, that's different from what I'd heard, but that could be right. Let me look into that, right? They cause us to have a, a limited or distorted way of thinking. They cause us to have an inability to have a conversation with people with different opinions because they're wrong and you're obviously right, so why even bother listening to them or talking to them? Our cognitive, and sometimes they are wrong and sometimes you are right, but sometimes, believe it or not, you're wrong. And they could be right, but you wouldn't be able to listen to them because of your cognitive biases. Now, my wife knows I'm never wrong. I thought I was wrong once, but then I was mistaken. I wasn't. <laughs> they cause us to judge others or situations incorrectly. 
and to not consider new information, even when it's more accurate or true than the information that we have. So if you haven't watched the last couple of weeks, I encourage you to go out on our YouTube channel or go to our, our website, and there's a link there to it, and, and catch up to where we're at. So we talked about filters, mental filters, cognitive filters, but it's not only the filter that matters, it's also the frame. How we frame a situation or frame a person in our minds will greatly affect how we then see it or experience it. So our cognitive biases and the way we frame a situation oftentimes will determine how we perceive what is happening to us or around us. But the good news is that with God's help, through the power of His Holy Spirit working in our lives, and through some intentionality on our part, we can reframe the way we see people and reframe the way we see situations. Reframing is creating a different way of looking at a situation or relationship by changing its meaning to us. It's simply creating a different way of interpreting or looking at a situation or relationship by changing its meaning. So here's an example of that. Here's how you could reframe a day, right? Let's say you wake up and you determine ahead of time. You haven't even gotten up yet. You're laying there in bed and you start thinking to yourself, that thinking is the framing of your day. You think, oh, this is going to be a bad day. I'm still tired. I didn't get a good sleep last night. And, and I know that when I don't get a good night's sleep, the whole day is ruined. Right there, you're framing your day through that frame, right? If you continue on and you might tell yourself, this is going to be a hard day. I've got so much to do today. I, I'm never going to get it all done. I work with these people. They drive me crazy. I can't stand going into work. And I, I'm so overwhelmed. I'm, I'm so tired. Life is hard. Why bother even trying? So you haven't even gotten up and you're already framing what your day is going to look like. Nothing's even happened yet. You haven't gone to work. You haven't had any conversations. You haven't gone out to do anything. And you've already framed this day and told yourself what your day is going to be like. Right? You come home, you're on your way home from work, and you think to yourself, you're not even home yet. Oh, my husband is driving me crazy. I cannot deal with my kids tonight. I'm sick of this stupid car. Uh, I hate the people I work with. I hate my job. You start telling yourself this, right? You have these thoughts. The more you think them, the easier they become to think. You're pre-framing your situations and your conversations and your interactions with people. So how great do you think your day is going to be if you start the day with negative framing and negative thinking? You're pre-framing the day with negative thoughts. Do you think you're going to have this awesome day? I would say it would be a lot harder to have a good day than if you did this. Try this. Here's the same day. Circumstances all the same, right? But instead, you wake up and you say to yourself, God, thank you for this day. This is going to be an awesome day. Sure, my circumstances are hard. Yes, you know, I've got some troubles, but I know that you're with me. I know that you love me. I know that you're going to give me the strength to get through this day. Thank you for the job that I have. Yeah, these people are crazy once in a while, but overall, really, we disagree on stuff, but they're, they're not bad. They're really good people. Uh, thank you for this old clunker that gets me to work and gets me back home again. At least I've got transportation. Thank you, God. And God, uh, thank you. Uh, I know this day is going to be a good day. We're just going to grind it out. We're going to get it done. And yeah, we might not get it all done, but we'll just do what we can. And I'll just ask you for your strength. Now, none of the facts in this situation has changed. The only thing that's changed is how you frame it, how you think about it in your mind. I, I said this each week, I'll say it again. I, this is not just the power of positive thinking. This is the power of God to work in your life, but it takes some work on your part too. It takes some intentionality. And I'm also not talking about lying to yourself. Right? I'm not saying, well, lie to yourself and say, this is great when it's not. No, we need to be realistic. But we all know that everything we do, every circumstance, every relationship, there's some good and there's some bad. I mean, that's just the way life is, right? But we can choose, are we going to just focus on the bad? 
Or are we going to focus on the good? And it doesn't mean if there's some bad stuff that you can make some changes. Well, maybe, maybe you need to. But you understand what I'm saying. There's always going to be some negative things. There's always going to be some positive things. You can choose what you want to think about and focus on. You have that choice. So I want to, I want to take just a minute. I want you to think about your life right now, however old you are, wherever you're at. I want to think about the expectations that you have had in your mind about how things would be going in your life right now, how they would turn out. And I wonder how many of you, I hope you're content with your life. I hope you're, we, with some ups and some downs, that you're at least still content and feel like, you know, this. I've had a, a good life so far. But sometimes it's easy to look at where we're at and how things are in our life and wonder, how did I get here? This is the opposite of what I had hoped for. This is the opposite of what I had worked for. Maybe by this time you thought that you would be in a better place financially or in a better place in your relationships. Maybe you really wanted something and then you look at yourself and think like, well, with all the education I had and job experiences, I should be the manager by now. Or I should have gotten that promotion that was given to this other person. Or maybe you dreamed of having a great marriage and things start out good, but somehow you look back and now a few years later, you're not sure if you can save this marriage anymore. Or maybe you've already broken up and gotten a divorce. I don't know. You're, you're looking at things that didn't meet your expectations. Maybe you prayed about it and you worked toward it with everything in you. But then somehow your life situation right now isn't what you expected. And you ask, why, God? Why did you let this happen to me? I did everything I could. I thought I was doing the best I can for you. Why am I in the circumstances I'm in? Well, if you think that, don't be too hard on yourself. You're not alone. Lots of people have found themselves not in the circumstances that they wanted or that they thought they would be in. In fact, one person is the Apostle Paul. He knows exactly how you feel. And his story is, it's so incredible because he had a heart for God and all he wanted to do was serve God. Originally, he was persecuting the church, going after the Christians, having them thrown in jail and even some of them killed. But then when Jesus revealed himself to him on his way to Damascus and Paul became a, a Jesus follower, all he wanted to do from that point on was to go and tell people how much God loves them and about Jesus Christ, that he was in fact the Messiah. And here's Paul, he's going around doing God's work. He's planting churches in different uh, countries and different cities. He's telling people about Jesus. And he's had some hardships, right? He was beaten, he was whipped, he was stoned and left for dead. He was shipwrecked. He kind of gives us a list of the hardships. But here he is, he keeps going. And one of his dreams, one of his dreams in his church planting and preaching was always to go to Rome. Because Rome was the capital. Rome was the center of everything. And if he could get to Rome and preach the gospel there and start a church and think about all the converts, think about the changes that could happen throughout the empire if he could go to Rome and preach. And instead of going to Rome to preach, he did go to Rome. And he found himself a prisoner there. Instead of just preaching in a good church, here he is locked up on house arrest waiting possible execution. He got the exact opposite of what he wanted. He got the exact opposite of what he had been hoping and dreaming for and working towards. He could have framed it towards the negative. He could have looked at it and said, hey, this life stinks. Following Jesus and God did not turn out the way I had hoped. And I gave God everything. I submitted everything to him. I gave him everything. And look at me now. Here I am just chained to a, a guard waiting possible execution. Might as well give up. What's the point? Maybe God doesn't really exist after all. Maybe I just had a dream. He could have framed his life and, and thoughts that way. But he didn't. Instead, he reframed his circumstances. Circumstances didn't change. He reframed his thinking. And while he was still in chains, he wrote this. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. 
Paul says, even though it looks like I am in bad shape, and physically he was, that didn't change. Even though I'm, it looks like I'm in bad shape, when I reframe it, when I see it clearly for what it is, I'm actually in chains for Christ. Paul was locked to a Roman guard, and every eight hours, he got a new one. There was a changing of the guard. And Paul framed his circumstances and his perception of his situation. And like this, he said, I'm getting to preach to a captive audience. And I get a new influential person from the uh, guard, the uh, royal guard, every eight hours who has to sit there and listen to my eight-hour sermon on how good Jesus has been to me. Who do you think the real prisoner was? Paul continues, and because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become even more confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So guess what, he says. It looks bad. It looks bad if you look at it from one way, but if you look at it from a different way, I'm in chains proclaiming the gospel even more boldly here without fear. And others have seen and heard what happened to me, and now they're also proclaiming the gospel even more boldly. It's not the facts that were different. It's how you frame it. It's not the facts. It's the frame. And God has given us help so that we can reframe our thoughts and renew our mind. And even in the midst of difficult circumstances, we can have the joy-filled life that God wants us to have. You can have a life with joy and peace, the life Jesus came so that you could have, regardless of your circumstances. God has given us help so that we can reframe our thoughts and have our minds renewed. But this process of reframing and renewal doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. It takes time, just like those neural pathways took time to get built up and it became easier and easier for you to think negative thoughts and just dwell on the negative. It also takes time to make that shift and change over. But it can be done. Paul tells us that it can be done through the power of God's Holy Spirit working in your life and, and intentionality on your part. There's some work that we have to do, right? God doesn't do it all for us. So here are some things that take intentionality on our part that can help us. The first is we have to, this is the next slide, Jason. The first is we have to take every thought captive. When we, uh, keep going, Garrett, keep going, I think it's one or two more. Yeah, here we go. Uh, when you recognize that you're having these negative thoughts, either just about your circumstances or thinking negatively about someone else, right? When you recognize that or a lie that you've been telling yourself and that you've believed, or maybe it was a, a parent or someone else that told you this lie and you've been holding on to it. When you recognize that, you start to entertain that and think it, you can stop that thought. You have the ability to do that. You can take that thought and submit it to Jesus Christ. You can pray and ask God to help you stop believing that lie. We talked about that first week. Find the biblical truth that refutes that lie. Look it up. Think about that truth instead. Pray about it. A second is to start recognizing your cognitive biases. We all have them. We all have, we can't help it. Our life and our thinking is shaped by our past experiences and by our personal preferences and beliefs. But that doesn't mean that we are always right. We just think we are. So when we take time to recognize, okay, I'm thinking this way, but this could just be a, a, a mental filter that I'm looking through. This could just be a cognitive bias that I'm uh, looking through. And when we take the time to be intentional about it, we're going to be able to recognize that. A third thing then we just talked about is to reframe your thoughts if you need to. Look at your circumstances or a relationship from a different perspective. Again, it doesn't mean ignore the bad if bad stuff is happening to you, but you don't have to dwell on it and only think about it. I promise you, you will always be able to find at least one good thing that you can think about and that you can dwell on. A fourth thing that we can do uh, is practice what we call pre-framing. Pre-framing 
uh, is where you decide ahead of time how you're going to frame a situation or an event when you get in that situation. This is important for all of us because we can decide ahead of time what we're going to think about something or how we're going to view a circumstance or an experience. Because when how we frame it and our thoughts, they end up shaping what we experience. And what we experience ends up shaping our lives. So when you can pre-frame, let me give you an example. Um, if you decide, you know what? There's always gonna be bad things that happen. There's always gonna be jerks out there. My car might break down. I might, I don't know, have a difficulty, but I know that God is with me and God loves me. So when that happens, I'm not gonna go there. I'm not gonna blame that on God. I might feel sorry for myself and say, oh God, why'd you let this happen? But I'm not gonna blame him. You can pre-frame right now and say, I'm not gonna think God caused bad things to happen. God doesn't want bad things for you. God wants good things for you. Now life happens and other people make decisions that affect us. That's unavoidable. What's not unavoidable is our ability to say, you know what, I'm not gonna blame. I'm not gonna blame God for that. Another way that you can pre-frame is to look for God's goodness in every situation. You can tell yourself, you know what, as I go throughout this day, I'm gonna be looking for God today. I'm going to look at, be looking to see His hand working in my life. I'm going to be looking to see God's hand and working in the lives of those around me. And if you can't find it and see it, if you pray and ask God to show you, to open up your eyes and your heart and your mind to see Him working around you, He will. He will do that. So, if you look for the good, you're going to find some bad and you will see some good. If you look for the bad, you will find it every time. If you want to see what's wrong every single day, you will find lots of things wrong in your life every day. And if you want to not like people, there are tons of reasons not to like people, right? People are annoying. Let's be honest with ourselves. They're annoying. But it's like the difference between a vulture and a hummingbird. Vultures go through life looking for dead things, for rotten things, for roadkill. Hummingbirds go through life looking for sweet things. And both of them live in the same day and they find what they're looking for. All right. Stop passively receiving circumstances and start actively interpreting them through a filter and a frame that says God loves you. God is with you. God is for you. No matter what your circumstances are. And this is important. We're not interpreting the goodness of God through our circumstances and what happens to us. Rather, we interpret our circumstances through God's goodness. You understand the difference? God isn't good or bad depending on if something bad is happening in your life at the moment. God is good regardless of what's happening in your life. And God wants good things for you. Please pray with me. Father, we ask that by the power of your word and the presence of your Holy Spirit in our life, that you would renew our minds with truth. Help us to demolish every stronghold and every argument, every pretension in our minds that sets itself up against the knowledge of the truth, the truth that you love us, the truth that you are for us, the truth that you have accepted us and you forgive us for our sins and our mistakes. Help us to accept the truth that maybe we're not always right and that there are different perspectives. Help us not to hold on to our cognitive biases. Help us to be able to reframe our lives so that we can look at things and look at others the way you see them. Renew our minds, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.